Welcome back, crew. Uh, today, we've got our second Meet the Maker. Uh, we're going to be joined by Matt Forbeck, the creator of the Marvel Multiverse uh, RPG. Uh, and Matt, thank you again for joining us. Uh, this is our second Meet the Maker, and I'm definitely happy we could have you on. Thanks for having me, Tig, and I appreciate it. It's going to be fun. Definitely looking forward to it. Uh, it's really kind of fun. I always like kind of talking to creators and going through uh, their overall creative process. So it's going to be kind of cool to see it with this one, uh, especially because me and my crew had a blast with uh, the Marvelverse RPG. Uh, had a little bit of tech issues on our <laughs> end, but we had a ton of fun with it. Well, I'm glad to hear that. You, know, you never know when somebody plays your game, you're like, oh, I just hope they like it. <laughs> It was fun. I, I I don't think I got to see you there, but I, I was at Gen Con. I got to play it for the first time at Gen Con. Oh, fantastic. Uh, we had a great time with it. Yeah, Gen Con was a blast. It was kind of crazy, though. It's a big blur after a while. You know, I've been doing Gen Con for uh, 42 years, I think, in a row now, since I was a little oh, nice. kid, um, which means that you know, it's, it's like a combination of a family reunion and the biggest party and the best games and all that. But it also means that the years tend to blend together after a while. So. Definitely believe it. Uh, so you were the old Milwaukee days then with Gen Con, weren't you? Oh, yeah. Uh, even back to Parkside, UW Parkside, which is in between Racine and Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, that's where the first ones I went to were. Um, I had gone to some conventions in Lake Geneva, too, because they used to run uh, Winter Fantasy and Spring Revel were two conventions that TSR ran back in the day before uh, they went bankrupt and got bought by Wizards of the Coast and all that good stuff. But so the first one I went to was actually a winter fantasy at the American Legion Hall in Lake Geneva, which is where I think Gen Con 3, something like that, was held. So it was just it's also where Gary Gygax's reception was after his funeral. So uh, it was kind of wild to be able to go back there and have those echoes in my head. Yeah. Nice. Well, those, I'm glad you had a storied history. This is my first time I actually making it out to Gen Con. So good to see oh, wow. all the craziness in person. But uh, it's definitely a blast. I'm going back next year, hopefully. Excellent. Well, I, I, it's my favorite time of year. I bring my kids. I've been doing it, like I said, for you know decades now, and uh, I I plan a lot of my year around it. You know, I just, it's just it, uh, Christmas might get skipped, Thanksgiving might get skipped, but Gen Con always happens. So. <laughs> and this one probably had to be a little extra special for you, uh, actually being able to bring a game to Gen Con because you guys came out like the the weekend before, right of Gen Con, I think. Yeah, actually, it was the Tuesday and Wednesday before Gen Con, which starts on a Thursday. So uh, Tuesday was the day it hit bookstores. Because new book day is Tuesday, and then Wednesday was new comic book day. So that was the day it showed up in the comic book stores. And then Thursday was the first day of the convention. So technically, we debuted just before the show did. Um, and also, I got to go out to Comic-Con at uh, San Diego just before that to help promote the game as well. So it was a crazy summer. Right? <laughs> I had like a week in between. And I was like, oh, I think I'm going to go to a cabin to decompress for a week in the middle of the woods. I bet was- two big conventions back to back would be a lot <laughs> Yeah, it does tend to get nuts. Unfortunately, I didn't catch anything, so I was able to actually be pretty healthy. I did catch some bronchitis after Gen Con, though, so I'm just getting over that right now. Hope you're feeling better on that side. Well, I, through the magic of antibiotics, I'm doing okay. <laughs> I actually lucked out because I got mine all. I should let me go back to because I used to have a really good local comic book store, but then I moved, and I've now just been an Amazon junkie. Uh, and luckily, okay. I got mine right before I left for Gen Con, so I was able to bring it with me uh, for Perfect. my uh, game. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I mean, I I always tell people, go to your friendly local comic or game store if you can. Uh, not everybody has one, right? I don't have one in my hometown either. So I have to drive an hour away or a half hour away or whatever to get to a good one. Um, and Amazon is very easy. <laughs> they're they're uh, seductive in that way. They're just like, yeah, sure, we can bring that right to you. And, right there. Okay. and they get faster and faster, which is the hard part. It's like, uh I ordered something yesterday and it got here by the end of the day. And I'm like, that's just, this is too fast for me right now. This is gonna... so they're just going to deliver stuff to you before you order it. You're going to say, yeah, you know, I was thinking about that. God damn it. You guys are you pitched this around your Alexa. So here you go. <laughs> exactly. But definitely, well, I, we've had a blast. Before we dive into the Marvel multiverse, one of the things sure. I always love to do with uh, tabletop RPG creators is to kind of see how you got in the hobby. And with you going to Gen Con for 42 years, I feel like you've got some time in the hobby. Yeah, uh, well, I started out when I was about 12 or 13 years old. A kid across the street from me, um, his mom picked up, uh, it was even before Basic Dungeons and Dragons, it was the um, the Holmes edition, as they call it, uh, which was you know, early original D&D, uh, after the white box set, but you know before they got to Basic D&D. Uh, she picked up at, at Kmart on a blue light special 
which, you know, most people, you know, younger than 40 probably had never heard of because, you know, Kmart doesn't really exist anymore. But uh, it was like this thing like, hey, there's a big sale. Come over here to the aisle and you know, pick this thing up for half price. So she did that, grabbed it and gave it to her son for Christmas. And he happened to live across the street from me. So one summer, uh, summer after that Christmas, we started playing. Man, we played every day, just all summer long. Uh, then we started going to conventions. And I was uh, fortunate enough to grow up only about uh, 30, 40 miles away from Lake Geneva, which is where Dungeons and Dragons started, where the where TSR, the publisher, was. Nice. So uh, because of that, I was able to start getting into conventions very early on and start doing design work with people and play testing and all that kind of stuff. So. Uh, if I had grown up someplace else, you know, I'd have gotten into like, if I grew up in LA, I'd have gotten into film, right? But I grew up in Southern Wisconsin. So uh, gaming is what brought me in. <laughs> That's really cool. I would have been so close to uh, Geneva. Have you got to meet uh, Gary Gaiax before? Oh, yeah. I met Gary at my first convention. Uh, I played in a tournament here in Beloit, where I live now, Beloit, Wisconsin. Uh, I was held at Beloit College and he signed, uh, I think it was my Temple of Elemental Evil book. I forget. Um, and nice. Then I actually worked for Gary when I was in college. I worked for a company called New Infinity Productions, New Infinities, uh, which was his second company after TSR, which did a game called Cyborg Commando, which nobody remembers, and rightfully so. It was terrible. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I worked for Gary in college, and then I knew him, uh, you know, many years after that. Uh, I went to his funeral because I was friends with him and his family uh, when he passed. And, you know, it's, I've been a guest of honor at Gary Con, which they hold in his honor every year after that several times um i usually go every year i can some years i'm out on business or whatever and can't make it but uh, because i also do video game work and sometimes i get hauled off to travel to other places to do that instead for some reason in march and april which is when gary kind is so um but i'm planning to be back again next year i think it's 15 this year coming up something like that it's either 15 this year or, yeah i think it's 15 this year something right. like that anyway I, I show up every time i get a chance it's not too far away from here it's a great chance to uh, catch up with all the guy gags kids and uh, play some really amazing games and have some fun. Uh, that's really cool. Getting got to meet the, the the founder of the I wouldn't say the founder of the hobby, one of the biggest pillars of the hobby, we'll say. Uh, on that yeah, side. yeah. I mean, Gary Gary did a lot. Uh, Dave Arneson, his co creator, was an amazing guy as well, and I knew Dave before he passed as well. Uh, you know, I've been doing this a long time, so I, anybody from that era, pretty much, I probably know at some point, right? <laughs> Uh, I'm not the first generation. I'm kind of uh, the second crew that came in uh, after the original generation went through. And I was pretty young for that generation, too. I was starting out when I was like 16, 17 years old. So now I'm much older than that. <laughs> um, but, you know, we have new generations coming in. I think it's fantastic. We have new people coming all the time. Uh, Gen Con is a much more diverse and fun. And, you know, in terms of like not just race and creed and color or whatever else but and uh and uh, orientation and gender but also of age right i mean you it was getting to the point at one point where it's just old white guys with beards and you're like well let's you know if, if you end up doing that then you end up being you know uh like model railroading where it's just you know guys in basements and their family wondering where the hell they've been uh, but having new fresh voices in is i think really important and it's been great that we see a lot more of that nowadays at gen con and a lot of the other conventions so I've been really pleased about that. And that's one of the reasons I bring my kids to the shows. We have, uh, I got five kids and I've, I've been bringing them all since they were 10 years old each. And my son, Marty, who's actually 24 now and married, uh, he actually worked on the Marvel game with me. He did all the character profiles and wrote up all the different, uh, did, built the characters and wrote up the profiles for me. So um, he's been, it's, so we actually have a second generation game designer in the house now, which is kind of funny. Well, actually, he's not in the house. He lives up in Appleton nowadays, but. You know, that's what happens when you get married. You move out and you, you find your own life. Uh, that's usually what we expect them. That's really yeah, well, cool that's that he what was you able want, to... right? You want your kids to be able to do that, right? You're excited for him. So I'm excited for him and, and for his wife, who's a lovely person. So we're pretty happy. That's sweet that he was able to help you with uh, kind of the profiles of building out some of the characters and stuff. Yeah, he's actually turns out a really good writer. Right? Uh, uh, I have more work than I can do these days. So uh, sometimes people call me up and say, Matt, do you have time for this? I'm like, no, but I happen to know this really good young man here who I will coach through this and make sure he does a good job. And uh, so he's been doing a lot of great work and you know, stunningly doesn't need as much help as I was afraid. You know, he's actually uh, like, I'll just go through and say, you know, his first drafts are actually really clean. And it's uh, me just going through, well, I would have written it this way, but that's just a matter of voice and style as opposed to this is wrong. Right. So uh he's very impressive i'm um if when he first told me he wanted to do this i was like oh 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 no <laughs> uh it's hard to make a living as a freelance creator uh but 
you know, he's got me to help him out. Uh, and he, you know, I've got a wealth of experience. So I can teach him, show him where the big potholes are at least. And then he can figure out, he'll find new mistakes to make on his own, I hope. Um, and, you know, hopefully do a better job than I did when I was starting out. So. That's cool. You kind of show up the ropes. You got a little uh, intergenerational uh, career going too. And yeah, exactly. Uh, it's kind of fun. And speaking of your writing, this is kind of not about tabletop RPGs, but I had two books of yours on my to my list. Uh, I saw you wrote some Halo. I'm a huge Halo fan yep. too. I haven't read them in a, a couple years, but uh, I saw those. I'm like I got to add those to my buy list. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, thank you. I think the the new Blood's actually on sale right now for like two bucks uh, oh, nice. on Amazon for Kindle or whatever. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I had great fun writing the Halo books. I was a big Halo fan, uh, from even before the game shipped, I actually got to go visit the Bungie offices in Chicago back where they were before they got purchased by Microsoft. Uh, and I was interviewing for a job working on one of their fantasy games. I think John Scott Tynes got the job actually. Uh, it was a freelance gig and John has now been with Microsoft for like 30 years. So I think he's doing okay. But, um, uh, but then when I came in to uh, interview them, they showed me around the office and showed me, hey, check out this new game we got we're working on. It's called Halo. It's kind of like the marathon stuff we did. But look, you can see like the dirt's different colors depending on where the warthog drives. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. So uh, when Simon & Schuster got the license to do Halo novels, I had actually written a, a, a Guild Wars 2 novel for them a few years before that. So I wrote the editor there and said, hey, remember you told me if I write these, you'd have other work for me? This is the work I want. And He's like, Matt, I was just writing you just now. What an amazing coincidence. And so, so we got those done pretty quick. I really enjoyed working on that stuff. That, that was pretty, I used to read, I've been behind on the books. Uh, I think the last books I read is one you actually made a sequel to based off title. Uh, I read Ghost of Onyx was the last one I've read yep. and all like the Eric Nyland, Nyland Eric Nyland stuff yep. uh, as well before that. So uh, that's on my list to get caught back up on now, especially since uh, you saw a familiar name while attached to it. Oh, there you go. I hope you enjoy them. I, I had a lot of fun working with them. Nowadays, it's mostly Troy Denning and Kelly Gay. Uh, Kelly's a great writer. Troy, I've known since I was a kid. He was actually one of the guys I met at one of some of my first conventions way back in the day. And he kind of mentored me into doing tabletop game design. And then uh, he and Mike Stackpole really helped me out when I was starting to do novels, too. I was like, going, how do you do this, guys? You know, how do you make the jump from one to the other? And these were guys I know had known at the time who had done that kind of stuff. So, uh, that's again, that's really cool. I didn't know to... those two were uh, tabletoppers, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Mike was uh, back with Mercenary Spies of Private Eyes. and. Troy actually was the head of game design for TSR for a while and actually offered me a job at one point. And uh, I was like, mm, that seems like not a lot of money to go leave my girlfriend. So no, I'm going to stay there. <laughs> if you can see behind me, I've got some uh, Star Wars blueprints. Yeah, so I've, uh, Mike Stackpole and uh, Troy did have read a lot of their Star Wars stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I, it's really cool that they're tabletop gamers too. That's really sweet. Oh, they've been forever. I mean, Troy was early on at TSR and, Mike was with Flying Buffalo, which was like the second large uh, role-playing game company. They did Tunnels and Trolls and a whole bunch of other stuff. And Mike also worked a bunch on Champions and Hero Game stuff. So uh, I've known those guys forever, seems like, right? Just fun, fun folks, too. But, uh, very lucky to have found so many good friends in the industry over the years. That just kind of blew my mind there. Uh, Mike Stackpole's <laughs> X-Wing series is one of my favorites. So it's really cool. Oh, it's like, amazing, right? Tabletop gamer. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, he... He ended up writing stuff for GDW and all sorts of different companies. In fact, he just came out with a book for Dark Souls. I think a licensed novel for Dark Souls for the video game, right? Uh, I think it came out earlier this year. So uh, go check that out if you get a chance. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but you know, knowing Mike, it's going to be fantastic. So Yeah, I have to add that to my list too. I'm a huge Dark Souls fan as well for the game. Yeah. So it'd be kind of cool what he does with that. Exactly. But uh, one of the big reasons we asked you here is about the Marvel Multiverse RPG. So how did uh, oh, how did you kind of get looped into this one? Or how did uh, this project come about? Um, that came about because it had been about 10 years since Marvel had done a role-playing game. Well, at the time we started talking to them, it had been more like eight years since uh, they had done a role-playing game. Or since a role-playing game had been done for Marvel, right? And that was the Marvel heroic role-playing game that came out from Margaret Weiss Productions, uh, which I actually had worked on. I had been one of the uh, original concept team guys under Cam Banks, who's an old friend of mine. And Cam was the guy who was the lead designer on that. And uh, the game didn't do terribly well for whatever reason. It, it ended up folding after just a few books. Uh, just sales weren't good enough or whatever. I don't really, I wasn't privy, privy to the inside information about it. But uh, I think it's safe to say everybody was disappointed that we didn't get more of it, right? 
And then uh, several years later, a guy named John Nee, who was the publisher of Marvel Comics, calls me up and says, Matt, how you doing? And he, would you like to work in a Marvel game? I'm like, oh, oh geez, yes, I would. Um, and I had kind of sworn off doing hardcore tabletop role-playing game design again. I did a lot of it back when I was younger. I ran a company called Pinnacle Entertainment Group. I was one of the founders. We did a game called Deadlands and Brave New World and nowadays Savage Worlds. And, you know, um, I was one of the founders and was the president for the first four years of the company. Um, and, but, you know, I've basically been doing mostly video games and novels and uh, pop culture stuff like Marvel encyclopedias for the last 10 years, whatever. And so when John called me up, I'm like, oh, geez that's um, okay sure you know because i love tabletop games and I, i've been doing them i just hadn't done a whole lot of hadn't been focusing on them surely and yeah but marvel i had written two editions of the marvel encyclopedia and an avengers encyclopedia and a captain america book and i had designed a marvel battle dice game for playmates toys and i had worked on a couple of different marvel mmos doing dialogue and so it was uh yeah right in my wheelhouse definitely something i wanted to do and i had met john uh, like two decades before that, uh, he had been uh, the vice president of Jim Lee over at Wildstorm, which was Jim's division of Image Comics at the time. And later on, Jim turned uh, and sold that division to Image, or, or sold his Image division to DC Comics. And now Jim is the chief creative director over at DC Comics, right? He's doing pretty well for himself. He's also one of the greatest artists of the, of the last 30, 40 years, especially when it comes to comics. He's amazing. Um, so I had gone over there and worked on developing a Wildstorm collectible card game for them in the early to mid nineties. And then, you know, John and I had kept in touch over the years. So when he wanted somebody to do the role-playing game, uh, I was his top choice. And I was like, yes, I should be great. Let's sign me up. I want to do this. <laughs> and it was good fun. You know, I, unfortunately, John ended up, uh, getting furloughed over the, uh, over the pandemic and his, gone back to being the uh, president or chairman or whatever the heck his title is for Cryptozoic, where he does a lot of great stuff as well, which is a great, uh, game design company as well. So it's uh, comics and games and all this kind of stuff in novels. They all tend to wind together. A lot of us who focus on story end up working in a lot of the same fields together. That's really cool to hear, especially because comics and games are two of my favorite interests. And I'm always happy to see kind of more, because I feel like, it's, I mean, there's a ton of fantasy tabletop games out, but there's not as many kind of the ones that cater to the superhero market. So I, I'm always happy to see that intersection coming in. Yeah, there have been a, a number of them over the years. I did Brave New World back in 1999. Uh, Steve Kenson's probably the guy who's done more uh, superhero role-playing games than anybody else in the world. Uh, there was Champions way back in the day, but Steve did uh, uh, Mutants and Masterminds and Masks, I think. The Masks is? Icons, I forget. I get all. He's done so many different things over the years. And he did the latest version of the DC Universe game too. So, um, you know, he he'd be a top choice of mine as well. If I if it if it hadn't been to ask me, I would have said, "Hey, call Steve up." So, uh, but there are a lot of great designers out there. I started out doing uh, Champions when I was a kid, and my first book I had that I wrote as a solo book, entirely on my own as a designer, was Western Hero, which was a Western version of Champions. Right. So uh, take the old West and use these superhero rules for it, which was kind of goofy, but it worked. It was a lot of fun. I had a good time working on it. Um, and, you know, that kind of cut my teeth with the whole game design or writing supplementary books for other people's stuff. Um, and so, you know, over the years, there have been lots and lots of games like this. And I ended up playing most of them over. I just, supers and, and games are my thing too. Yeah. Nice. Uh, and I've gone through, I'm, that's my, one of my big things to do is go through and play all the different superhero kind of uh, inspired tabletop RPGs. So far, we've done uh, Marvel Multiverse, uh, Mutants and Masterminds, which is the first one that kind of started with uh, yeah. Mask and Champions. Uh, so I want to go through Sentinels and Icons next. Uh, oh. well, it's definitely one of my little hobbies there. Those are great ones. Uh, there's a classic one, the original DC Universe, DC Universe, DC Heroes game. Uh, DC Heroes role-playing game came out back in like 87, 88, designed by Greg Gordon, and that had a, a logarithmic scale in it. So you could put Batman and Superman on the same scale, right? Uh, but it, it required a wheel for you to actually, you know, do all the math for it. Um, and I, when I was in college, I got paid to run around to different conventions and comic book and game stores in Chicago, Milwaukee, and the Midwest area and demonstrate the game to people, teach them how to play. So I've been, you know, again, that was another thing where, been in this kind of stuff for decades and just love it to death and I'm uh, deeply honored and feel lucky to be able to keep doing it. 
Nice. And kind of speaking of like uh, the mechanics of the some of the old school wheels, uh, how did you come up with uh, the Marvel mechanics on the side? Uh, the three D six with the Marvel die, something I haven't really seen before. Yeah, that was actually uh, myself and John Nee and a guy named Mike Caps, who was uh, a original designer of the game with me. Um, Mike's got a doctorate in mathematics and you know went to MIT for undergrad. He's a very smart guy. He also was a lead writer in like Fortnite and Gears of War, and you know did a ton of work for Epic Games over the years. Um, so we came up with the, the mechanic and Mike was the guy who tested the math out. I'm like, does that work? And he's like, yeah, I can show you how I'm like, okay, I trust you. You know, it's okay. Um, uh, and originally it was just a roll them up and add your, you had to add a number of different modifiers to it, whether it was your ability and your, there was another thing for your archetype, which we then uh, axed the archetypes at a certain point and a few other things that got fairly complicated, but during the play test period, uh, we streamed all that. We streamlined all that down, made it simple. Um, originally, we had a book came out back in April of 22, which was the playtest version of the book of the game. That was 120 pages, ten dollars, paperback, comic book size. Looked like a trade paperback from Marvel, and uh, that was a much more complicated version of the game. Then we trimmed it down to what it is now. So, uh, but the original D616 idea comes from that first product. We did add a few things to it, and, and uh, like the fact that you multiply your Marvel die by your rank, essentially, to get your damage, was a newer thing that came out in the second round of, of playtesting and such. Uh, and that really did, I think, help the game a lot. It's just one roll to hit and damage, and uh, there's some hidden math going on there that makes it really sing, and I'm really happy with that. I really like that. I'll be honest, it was one of the things I was a little skeptical about first with everything being off the 3D6 and kind of scaling from there. But uh, in play, it works really well. Like uh, it keeps everything moving. And I don't know if this was your guys' intent, but especially with kind of like the MCU feeling where everything is always kind of progressing forward, it kind of feels like it emulates that a bit. Were you guys kind of going for that same feel with having everything kind of be with that one rule? Definitely, definitely. We want it to be quick and easy, but also have this blockbuster feel to it, right? Uh, so when you get in battles, it, it feels like there's heroic things happening, amazing things happening. The, the interesting thing about using the D616, which is really a 3D6 with a couple of wrinkles in it, is that it has a bell curve for the mathematics, right? So the stuff in the middle is far more likely to happen than anything on the edges of your results. Whereas if you're playing something like Dungeons and Dragons or Call of Cthulhu, they have a flat curve. So everything on the scale is equally likely to happen. So that means in our game, uh, you know, a bonus of like plus two is massive right? Because it shifts you a little bit on that. And if it shifts you from barely possible to happen to really possible to happen, or almost incredibly unlikely to not happen, it makes a massive difference, right? Uh, and getting that math right was actually a good chunk of the uh, playtest process between the first and second versions of the game. So uh, it worked out really well. But I think the uh, the neat thing with the math for the um, for the damage dice, I've explained this to a bunch of people. I, I was when we first started coming out with it, uh, C.J. Cervantes is my producer at Marvel. He's like, we should try maybe multiplication. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. It's just too complex. People don't like to multiply it. Um, but then we originally had the ranks of the game going from like one to 25, and we'd simplify it to six. I'm like, okay, if we got six ranks, and we got six sides in a die, and we can just multiply that, that's easy. Six times six is a max, up to 10 maybe if you got a lot of different modifiers in there for strength or whatever. That's fairly simple. You're talking single digit math or you know 10 times, which is really easy to do. Um, but the neat thing about it is that if you if you're you're rolling against a target number, right? So if you're trying to roll against that target number and it's really easy for you to hit, you can have a broad range of damages that come off that. It can be really low, it can be really high, whatever. But if you're trying to hit somebody who you barely have a chance to hit, like you know, you're Spider-Man trying to punch out Thanos, right? You're like, okay, I gotta put everything into this, make sure I I Tweak, tweak the dice as much as I possibly can, give myself every advantage, and I'm finally going to get that punch in. And if you do get the punch in, that means you're probably getting good numbers all the way across on all three dice that you're rolling, right? And that means that when you hit, the chances are very good that the damage you're going to do is massive, right? As opposed to, I finally hit him and tink, oh, it just bounced off his armor. You know, who cares, right? You want it to be, I finally hit him and boom, he slides off against the opposite wall. And, you know, it's it's all good fun from there, so. But that's that's hidden in the math. And just when we came up with that, I was like, oh, that's really cool. You know, that's going to work amazing because it really does reinforce that whole heroic feeling to the game. Right. That when you put everything you possibly can into it, when you're spending your karma points and all the stuff that you've built up over the game, and all the different advantages you've been trying to set up for yourself, the edges that you can actually pull something off and have it be meaningful. That, I think, really comes through in the mechanics, which is amazing. Right? 
I really like that we noticed that in our playthrough too. Uh, actually, both playthroughs, yeah, because I had uh, my Gen Con playthrough, and then one of my players chose Hawkeye. Uh, and one and one thing we'll get into this a little bit later. I love how different ranks can still play and still feel uh, still feel valuable and kind of have that feel comic book feel where people have those different strengths but still can kind of go in it. Uh, yep. Both times Hawkeye had the most damage uh, with uh, some of the different uh, edges and abilities uh, they can stack up with his shots. Uh, yeah. It was just really cool to see. Again, that's because Hawkeye, because for him to hit somebody, it's he needs to really do well, right? Which means when he does hit, it's going to come through. You know, it's fantastic. Whereas, you know, if the Hulk comes up, he's like, boom, and it might be, oh, puny humans. And it, it doesn't work as well. So it's it's easy for him to knock over a car. <laughs> so. We saw that come through, man. That's really cool to see kind of the, the we, we saw it, but we didn't understand that piece behind the, the math on that. It, so it's that, really hidden. Cool and that's see. one of the neat things about it is that it's it's this, and I'm not trying to brag here because it came out through playtesting and community effort, but it uh, it's this hidden element that's elegant because Nobody has to explain it to you. It just happens. Whether you care about it or not, it just happens, right? And that is the kind of game design I think we all strive for when we're doing game design. It's something that where the, the mechanics you set up inherently feed into what you're trying to pull off. And you don't have to explain it to anybody. It just works on its own without any help at all, which is, man, I, you don't get that very often. I've been doing game design for a long time. When you can pull something like that off, you're like, that's going to be good. You know? yes. <laughs> it flows well. Um... Well, with that too, so it sounds like I, I unfortunately didn't get a chance to play the play test. Uh, but it sounds like there's some kind of complexity. Or some That's pieces, okay. This uh, is a much got... better version. <laughs> it's, it's a much better version. You saved yourself some headaches. <laughs> the original version was not bad. I mean, it would have been an okay game, right? Um, but this is a much better game. So it, it really sings on a lot of different levels that the original didn't. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy that we produced this version of the game. It, Honestly, doing the public play test was one of the best things we could have done. I wasn't 100% sure if we should have when we came up and when we announced it, people were like, really? You're going to make us pay to play test? It's, I'm like, that's <laughs> 10 bucks. You know, and it's not that much. It's a little tiny. It's okay. You don't have to. Nobody's forcing you. But, um, but you know, it really helped us tremendously because we got feedback from tens of thousands of people that we were able to aggregate. We had a guy named Amir Osman, who's our junior producer, associate producer, who came in and, uh, you know, collated all that data because dear god i wasn't gonna be able to spend the time to do it myself and um and said well this is what people are saying and, you know like what about this he's like nobody's caring about that you know like okay we can ignore that one, right um and it's one thing you know when you're play testing stuff around a table with your friends it's great you can really help but it's hard to get enough feedback to meet to know whether or not it's just that one group you're working with or everybody right but when you do a public play test like that you're like well you know, three people cared about this and said it was wrong. Well, that's, you can ignore that with those three people because it's three out of 10,000 or 20 or whatever the hell it was. But if you have 500 people say this is a problem, then you're like, oh, okay, this is something we need to pay attention to. And it really is particularly important. You know, sometimes you just get people misread something, right? And that's okay. That happens. That's, you know, people are human. We make mistakes. But if everybody is doing it in a way you're like, oh, that's not, that's not good at all. We need to fix that. So. Uh, the public playtest was immensely helpful to us. Plus, we did a bunch of uh, personal playtesting with game designers, I know, too, that uh, after we did the initial playtest, I'm like, okay, this is where it's wrong. Let's break this to pieces. We'll tear it down the studs. Help me figure out where I need to go from here. And that was immensely valuable, too. Kind of along with that, I, I imagine this is probably one of the areas that has to be tweaked because it's probably the hard. It is from my out, outside view as a non-tabletop designer, but I feel for superhero games, designing the powers is probably always like the uh, the sticking points. Uh, how do you guys kind of go about that? Especially because I kind of a little, put a little, not, not context, but extra behind it because I know I've, I've played uh, Mutants and Masterminds and Champions, which is kind of like on that heavy side over there where it's like a lot of different moving pieces along it. Uh, and then kind of on the very other opposite side, Mask, where it's kind of super, very light, more drama-oriented. Uh, I kind of thought you guys hit a really good spot in the middle of those two. Was that like where you guys were intentionally shooting for? How did that kind of process overall go yeah, for you? I, I think so. Uh, we definitely were trying to shoot it, you know, something that was not in, not too complex. We had two audiences we were trying to reach with the game, uh, one of which was existing gamers, right? So people who play role-playing games already, which, you know, 90% of them are probably Dungeons and Dragons players, but you know everybody, because I play all sorts of games, and I know lots of people who play all sorts of games. If you're a designer, you're usually playing dozens of different types of games, right? Um, so we wanted to reach out to that crowd, but we also wanted to reach out to people who were uh, Marvel fans who were RPG curious, 
right? Who thought, you know, that D&D looks kind of cool, but I can't, you know, the idea of having pointy ears and a stabby sword is not what I want to do. I want to have, you know, a mask and fists and capes and all this kind of stuff. Um, so we want to be able to reach out to both those crowds. So we want to have something that had enough crunch to it and was familiar enough to people who play, you know, traditional role-playing games that they would look at it and say, okay, I, I get this instantly. I know what this is like, right? Like the powers lists are kind of like spell lists in Dungeons and Dragons, right? Here's all sorts of different choices, a lot of different ways you can put it all together. It's really up to you. It's actually more complex than that, but it's not as complex as some other systems are, right? There's 330 different powers in the, in the rulebook. We try to balance them all out. It's insanely <laughs> challenging. I'm actually adding new powers right now for the X-Men book and having to go back there and go, okay, where's my head then? And how do I get this in there? And okay, I got to make sure it's in between and the wedge. <laughs> the mute space. I imagine that's going to be a little bit of a handful. <laughs> yeah. But we also wanted it to be something, you know, when you have lists like that and, you know, basically trees where you say, okay, if you get this power, then you can take this power or this power, maybe this power over here. Maybe you want to take this one over here. That allows people who are maybe not RPG fanatics, but, you know, uh, are, again, curious about it, love Marvel. They can follow it and see the path they want to go through. Again, if you played a lot of video games over the years, you'll recognize that kind of stuff, too. You know, the, the power trees, the skill trees. And we're like, okay, we can embed this in here in a way that feels familiar to people, but is different enough and also heroic enough and feels like Marvel, because that was one of our other things. We didn't want to make just a generic role-playing game. We didn't even want to make a generic superhero role-playing game. We wanted to make a Marvel game, and I think that we succeeded at that. That was actually one of CJ's big things. He would pound on the drum. He's like, must be a Marvel game. And we're like, okay, we'll, we'll get it done. Um, you know, we want it to be fun. That was the other question. Is it fun, and is it Marvel? Right? And if we could do both those things with anything we were doing, we knew we were on the right track. I think you guys knocked it out of the park. Uh, it's fun. It's Marvel. And, it, and one of the nice things about it, uh, one of the things I really love about it, I'm, probably my um, outside of this, my favorite superhero tabletop RPG uh, is Mutants and Masterminds. But one of the nice things with this one compared to Mutants and Masterminds is one of my players, uh, three of them chose like the, the three existing heroes that are in the system, kind of the existing Marvel heroes. Uh, but one of them made his own character. Uh, nice. And he did it all on his own. I didn't have to talk to him, talk him through it or uh, kind of go into it, uh, which I love. And as I said, I love Mutants and Masterminds. But whenever I bring a new player to the system, I usually schedule a one-on-one -on -one session to go through and build their PC just to, just to make sure it makes sense. Uh, with this, right, uh, I didn't hear from him. He had a character. <laughs> that's wonderful. That's exactly the kind of thing you want to hear, right? It should be something that anybody who can sit down and read. I mean, it's a thick book like most of these things are. But uh, I mean, honestly, if you look at the book, I got to right here right you look at the book and like the uh the red part is the profiles right those are the profiles that marty wrote and the blue part of the powers right and then uh the rest of it's you know mostly the combat rules which are pretty thin there's like 50 pages of it and you know how to create a character and stuff like that but uh you don't have to know all the book in order to be able to play you only have to know this one small section to get going in fact we've been teaching people we figure out how to teach people in minutes which is you know a wonderful one here's the dice mechanic here are your statistics go you know here you're captain marvel you're spider-man you're captain america you're wolverine go have fun and then it, but you get somebody to sit down and create their own character and they can do it pretty quickly roll 20 has got a great new uh character builder app that's available too that you can use without even having to subscribe to roll 20 and then you can take that and use it anywhere you want to, too. You don't have to be part of the virtual tabletop system to do it. You can take it, put it on your phone, and just bring it to your uh, get your tabletop game as opposed to just doing it on, online as well. So I've been pretty happy with that. It's looking pretty good. The character builder was really nice. That's why I went through and I built Annihilus uh, for uh, uh, nice. the, the bad guy they fought. So uh, I used that character builder. It was just really it was quick and easy on that side. So I think that's a, a really nice thing for the superhero side to have. And this, I think you guys, and I wanted to give a compliment here. You guys did a great job with the powers and making them all feel kind of meaningful and diverse while still not making it like you have to have a chart out and kind of plot everything out down to the, yeah. down to the minutia. So that really great job with that. Thank you. Yeah, we, we sweated the details in that one pretty hard. And again, the playtesters were hugely helpful in that stuff, right? Just to make sure that it, everything made sense and that everything related to each other properly. That was a lot of work. Uh, and trying to keep that all in my head at once was it's like, whoosh. it's like the beautiful mind stuff where there's just, you know, different equations going over here. But the trick is I want to make it all smooth and easy so that people can just go through it real quick. And um, I think we succeeded. You know, we'll see how well it does. I mean, the game's selling pretty well, and we're pretty happy with it. The reception's been very good so far. So, uh, you know, now the trick is coming up with more cool things that people can do with the game, which is you know, next steps. Got the Kang Adventure coming out in November, so we're excited about that. 
and then the X-Men book coming out early next year and the Spider-Verse book coming out late next year. Uh, so the X-Men one's the big one I'm excited for. I'm a huge X-Men fan. So I saw that X-Men was first and I was stoked for that. Uh, <laughs> anything you can reveal about the X-Men book? Anything cool coming with that? Or I'm not supposed to talk out of school about things that have been announced, but um, Fair enough. I can tell you we have uh, you know a bunch of new characters in it. We have a bunch of new powers in it. Uh, we're also for that book. We're focusing on team themes, right? So okay. there's a mechanic in the game for team maneuvers, but we're going to be expanding on that kind of a thing. You know, X Men is really all about teams, right? It's always about are you the original team, are you X Force, are you X Men Gold, X Men Blue, X Men Red, whatever. How how can you form those teams? How can you juggle those teams? What does it mean to be on a team? Do, you know, and so we're going to be exploring that quite a bit in that book too, and I think that's going to be a lot of fun. Plus, like I said, some new powers that we didn't cover in the main rule book, but uh, look like they're, you know, when you're doing the X-Men book, you're like, oh yeah, we kind of need that one. I think we have to add that in there now. Um, and then, you know, the Spider-Verse book is going to be more about uh, individuals because, you know, Spider-Man's an individual. He, he often will team up with people, but it'll be smaller groups as opposed to larger teams. Uh, and also we'll concentrate a bit more on your your uh uh, supporting cast right you know so like aunt may and j jonah jameson and your roommates and you know the people you go to college with and people at work all that kind of stuff because um those are often the things that make the adventures and the rest of the stories have meaning right it's not that you're saving somebody you're saving somebody you care about as opposed to just some you know rando on the street who you know hey we all value human life you want to save them but if it's the person you love most in life that raises the stakes even higher so that that's really what we're leaning into with that book. That'd be really cool to add some additional kind of uh, emotional stakes you can pull out your players. Uh, exactly. So. so with that, and this is my hope, I don't know, you probably can't say if this is ever going to come, but will there be like a cosmic expansion? Because I, I noticed, unfortunately, my favorite superhero wasn't involved, so I'm hoping there's a cosmic expansion to, Who's your favorite to bring superhero? Silver Surfer in. So. Which one was that? Uh, Silver Surfer is my favorite. Silver Surfer. Uh, well, I think it's been told that you will see the Silver Surfer coming up in the Kang book. So you, there, there are stats. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't see that. That's that's cool. Yeah, there's uh, the Kang book has got uh, like 60 new characters in it. Most of them are uh, are uh, villains, right? They're fighting against because it's an adventure book. It's The Kang book has got six different adventures in it. They're linked together, and they're for each of the six different ranks. So they can take you all the way from, you know, shield agents at street level all the way up to cosmic heroes like the Silver Surfer, Captain Marvel. Um and each one of the adventures also has a group of heroes that we provide for you that you can use for playing the adventures through too. If you ever played the original uh, gold, uh, the yellow box or whatever back in the 1980s that TSR came out with, uh, all those adventures like, okay, for this adventure, you're the Fantastic Four. Over here, you're the Avengers, right? They're, you can play through them with your own characters, but they always said, you know, this is meant for this kind of a kind of group here. So we kind of did that with this too. So we're like, you know, you play with these, you can play with your original characters, you swap them out, we don't care. As long as we're within the same rank area, right? Uh, so if you're playing rank three characters, you play the rank three adventure, or you can even start at rank one and then work your way up to cosmic level, you know, do your origin story and make it all the way up. It should be a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, Silver Surfer comes in that, and that actually, because it goes from street level to cosmic level, you're going to see a lot of different types of characters in there. Uh, for the future, we have talked about different books. Uh, we haven't announced anything yet. The only things we've announced so far is what I mentioned. But, you know, it's, it wouldn't shock anybody to hear that we've thought about things having to do with the Avengers, the Guardians of the Galaxy, and et cetera, et cetera. Because, hey, you know, Marvel's got some of the greatest properties and teams and, and characters in the world. Uh, we'd be foolish not to want to get into those. But, you know, we can't do everything at once. So we're, we're going to do the best we can. I'm just happy to hear Silver Surfer's coming. I was I was one of the after I went to the power profile, that's the first one I flipped the ass. I'm like, oh no, Silver Surfer. So I'm glad uh he'll be uh in the King book. I'll have to make sure to pick that one up. Yeah. Uh, well, we knew when we were doing the main book, which ones we were saving for the King book. And we're like, okay, well, let's see, who do we need? Oh, he's definitely in the King book because uh and we could have put him in the main rule book too, but he fits really well with the King book. You'll see. Don't want to spoil him. <laughs> you got something to look forward to. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, kind of with that, what's what's your favorite Marvel superhero? What was uh, what's your favorite Marvel superhero, and which is the one like of your favorite of the power profiles you guys have done? Oh, that's a, that's a tough question. Well, the, my favorite superhero forever has been Spider Man, right? I grew up reading Spidey comics when I was a kid, and uh, you know Peter Parker, etc. Miles Morales is also a favorite of mine. He's fantastic. He's so much fun. Um, 
but I also wrote a Captain America book about five, six years ago. And I kind of fell in love with Cap at that point too, both the Steve Rogers and uh, now I'm going to blank on, on Falcon's name, Sam Wilson versions. Um, you know, they're, they're amazing guys. They really are both of them. And even the Peggy Carter versions for crying out loud, you know, um, I, there's something great about the idealism that goes along with Captain America, even, and oh, you know, boy. they often will butt him right up against the, the actuality of politics in America, but you still maintain the idealism through it. I think that's something heroic just in that, much less punching Nazis, which is always good fun. So um, as far as profiles, man, that's a tough one. There are a lot of great profiles. You know what the profiles I'm most excited to see I can't tell you about because they're brand new villains that we came up with for the Kang book. And when you see them, you're going to go, oh, my God. Oh, it, it's going to be very exciting. I, we were doing this. I'm like, I can't believe I get to do this. This is going to be so much fun. <laughs> Well, I didn't know there was going to be 60 uh, new characters uh, coming for the Kang books, too. So that's, that's really great. It's going to be a like pretty expansive uh, group of Marvel characters between the 100 or so in the main book and the 60 to come with that. There's 130 in the main book, 60 in the Kang book, probably around 100 in the X-Men book and the Spider-Verse book. So, you know, we're trying to – it's always a tough thing because you don't want to just give people all the characters in the world. But on the other hand, I mean, the X-Men, you could probably do six books just on the characters, right? So. <laughs> Um, but you want to give people ways, new ways to play the game as well. So new rules and, you know, rules for things like the danger room and stuff like that. And it, it gets crazy. So you have to try to balance this stuff out because again, you can't do everything at once, right? Um, you gotta do what you can when you can and try to come up with a good mix that you think will make as many people happy as possible. That's great to hear, especially the danger room rules, and especially that X Men's getting another hundred. Yeah, because you could you could probably do yeah, four or five books purely X Men characters and still have some left over. So I'm really oh, glad uh, that there they're getting the so full kind of book treatment. Oh my god, it's it's really in, it's intense and insane. You're like, and part of the long conversations are okay. Which ones do we do right? <laughs> uh, and you know, do we do early X Men? Do we do you know the original X Men as a separate set of profiles or because they actually came back from the past at one point. We're adventuring around with the, the modern guys. For a while. <laughs> well, that, that's kind of fun, you know, but, you know, if we already got those, should we save the space for somebody else who's new, who's exciting? I mean, there's so many different ones that are pretty damn cool. Um, so, yeah, we're having hard conversations at the moment about which ones we have to keep and which ones we have to cut. So we'll see where we land. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to that one. I'm a huge X-Men fan, uh, and that'll be a cool one to see in all the different mutant heroes, villains, and everywhere in between that come along with that. Uh, it's a lot of fun. I mean, I'm, we're really having a good time with it. Marty's doing a great job with character profiles, and I'm having a lot of fun with the new rules. Although, again, they're making my head swim, but it's a lot of fun. <laughs> like to ask creators uh what's like um what's one thing you'd want people to know about your game somebody that may have not had a chance to play they've just kind of seen what's one big thing you'd want them to know i think if you're a new gamer and you've never played a game like this stepping up to a big 320 page book might scare you a little bit like i was trying to say before it's actually a lot easier to learn how to play than that right uh and one of the great secrets about role-playing games in, is of any kind is that you really only need one person at the table who really knows what they're doing and everybody else can just play and kind of fake their way through it, right? They're, my criteria, my my main pillar for role-playing games is if you're having fun, if everybody, if everybody at the table is having fun while you're doing it, you're doing it right. Don't worry about whether or not it's correct by the rules as written or whatever. If you're having fun, that's the whole point. Enjoy it. Enjoy the way you're having it, right? Uh, so don't feel like you have to be rigidly within certain walls of this. Go have fun. The great thing about tabletop role-playing games is that it's not a computer game, right? Computer games are great. I love video games. I play the crap out of them. I, I write for video games, right? But video games can't can't innovate, can't improvise the way that people can around a table, right? And the jokes and the fun you're going to come up with when you're playing this game with your friends are just going to be immeasurable, and you're going to remember this stuff for years to come. And that, that's great advice. It's one thing they always like to say, too, because people get so caught up in the rules. Like, definitely learn the rules if you can, uh, but just like, don't worry about having a perfect recall. Just go in and go with your gut if you're the DM and kind of see what flows. <laughs> exactly. You know, people worry because they're like, am I doing it right? You know what? The answer is probably probably not. Who knows? <laughs> Ideally, you are doing it right if there is a right way to do it. But again, as long as you're enjoying yourself, I'm not going to tell you you're doing it wrong. I mean, you could be doing it entirely different than what we wrote. And as long as you're having fun, I don't care, right? Nobody else should either. 
You go ahead and have, have the fun the way you want to. Once the game is out of our hands and in your hands, it's your game, not ours. And you, it, a game doesn't really come to life until it has people playing it, right? You guys are the other half of that equation. So you're out there actually making this game come to life. And, and man, I just love watching people play this game. It's, it's just so much fun. I've had a blast with it. As you, and to one of your earlier points, I learned it at Gen Con. Uh, yeah. I learned like the basis, the basics of it at Gen Con. Uh, the game master kind of just like you said, passed out the sheets and basically said, "Roll three d six, and I'll tell you what what you're rolling." And we go from there, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. All right. We try to keep it simple for you. you. Know, there's a lot of different options. If you really get into it, you can you know get your sink your teeth in it and do all sorts of different things with it. Create your own characters, make up all sorts of wacky stuff. But if you just want to sit down and play Spidey and you know uh, and Wolverine or whoever else you want to play Captain Marvel, go for it. You know, enjoy it. And that's actually another thing I really want to give a compliment to as well. Having all those pre-gen characters in there, I think more RPGs even outside of the ones with kind of iconic properties should have that because a lot a couple of my players just didn't have time to make their own characters so they could go through and still uh, still be able to join in the fun and have so, like have some pre-made character that they've got some connection to. Yeah, well, that's one of the great things about a Marvel game, right, is that it has some of the best characters in the world, right, some of which have got, you know, 80-plus years of history behind them. So, yeah, it makes sense that we have to have these pre-made characters for you guys, but it's uh, because you want to play. You want to play Spider-Man. You want to play Cap. You want to play whoever else, right? Um, but one of the things we did, one of the uh, conversations we had early on was, should we cheat when we come up with the Marvel characters? Do we have to obey the rules that we're making everybody else obey? Uh, when they're came, coming up with their characters, right? And I said, yes, we should. So, uh, because, I mean, sure, we could say, well, you know, these are Marvel characters and they're special, so we get to do them our way. It doesn't matter, right? But uh, every character in that book is an example of how to build your own character. It's all done by the rules. So you can say, okay, uh, let me see how they did this here. And I can riff, riff off that to create my version of this or my take on that, or whatever. People are like, well, I don't think Daredevil should be ranked two. They should be ranked three or four. Fine, go make them. You, know, you can just add it on there. Go have fun. That would be awesome. Enjoy it the way you want to enjoy it, right? Uh, again, we try to make it an example for you, but you know, if you want to tailor it to whatever you want to do, that's your, that's your right and your prerogative, and we encourage it. You guys did a great job with that. And one of the things I saw, because one of my players played Iceman uh, in the the, you know, the one shot, uh, and I was wondering, because he wanted to do the ice slide power. I'm like, I don't know how they did that. Uh, and I, I like how you uh, had the flight in there, but you can kind of just play, because basically it is flight when you look at it. Uh, so I like yeah. how you're able to kind of break that in. And it comes down to flight, but I mean, it's like, but you know, it's somewhere behind her, the ice is attached to something. Sure it is. <laughs> it's where we don't know the physics of that don't possibly work right it's a miracle though you know <laughs> leave the physics for later exactly um, it's like yeah, where so, spider-man's webs go well you know if, if he's in new york it's easy they hit something we don't know it's probably on a building <laughs> if you're playing the video games like every time you kick somebody off of uh, a wall and they fall to their death it's like did spidey just kill somebody no he's webbed up over there he's fine <laughs> That was one of the interesting things for the Insomniac game. I'm like, I just threw a guy off the thing, and you look over and you see somehow yeah. during while you're still fighting other guys, he was able to capture him with the woods. He's magically yeah. taped up there. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. Now I feel better about it. <laughs> Perfect. Well, kind of wrapping up, I've got two last questions for you. Uh, so this, we got one from Marvel and then one just for tabletops. So we're going to go for the tabletop one first. Um, okay. Outside of the Marvel multiverse, what are you playing? Like, kind of what's uh, in your rotation? Oh, man, I'm not playing a whole lot of tabletop role-playing games these days other than the Marvel game because it sucked up most of my life. Um, I do play a lot of board games with my kids. We play things like Betrayal, and uh, Betrayal Legacy was a great one for us. We played Betrayal of House in the Hill, which is a favorite from around here. Uh, we play a lot of Wingspan. Uh, we play a lot of Munchkin. I play, as a game designer, you often play games once. So I've got stacks of games I've played once because... Uh, I'm not really there to get good at the game. I'm there to see how it works. And once I see how it works, I'm like, oh, that was fun. Cool. Now I know how it works. I can move on to the next thing. Uh, we played a rocket game of Car Wars 6 Edition a few weeks ago, too. That was a lot of fun uh, from Steve Jackson Games, which is all about you know, blowing the crap out of people in other cars. Um, what else we play? All sorts of stuff. Now, again, we just we go to Gen Con. We come back with a stack of games. Machi Koro 2, we started playing. Um, whatever else comes our way, just because it's there's not enough time to play all the wonderful games in the world there's so many choices nowadays right but i'm always it's like reading books you're like i want to see how they did this okay cool and then you move on to the next one 
definitely makes sense. And shout out to Betrayal House in the Hill. I love that game. I haven't played the Legacy version yet, but I, I love the original one too. That's the only Legacy game I managed to get my kids. We picked up stuff like uh, uh, Pandemic and other Legacy games. And we get about three three games into it where our attention wanders, right? We're like, ah, okay, we'll get back to it someday. And we never do. Legacy, uh, Betrayal Legacy was the first one we ever got through. So I was really happy to see that happen. So it took us about a year. Yeah. But my kids are older now. They're off wandering around doing college and stuff like that. So we don't get to get together as often as we used to. But it was, uh, and even then you're like, well, they're busy high school and college students. So it takes a while. But it took us about a year to get through that in between doing a lot of other games. That's cool. I mean, especially you'll be able to finish the legacy game. Me and my friends got into two or three games of risk and then high management just kind of flew away and we haven't been able yeah. to get back to it. And I don't know if my friend still has all the pieces now, but that's, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, it's not often like if somebody says you're going to play this game 12 times in a row. I mean, there's a lot of games I don't play 12 times in a row. Right. So to actually have to sit down and go, OK, I'm going to play this again. All right. It's got to be something special. Right. It's got to be something you really want to play. And I think they did a great job with it. I think there's a new game coming out. Uh, I think this fall, they're going to do Ticket to Ride as a legacy game. And Ticket to Ride is a great game. Uh, and I know Rob Davio and the crew are working on that. And I'm excited to see what they do with the new one. So uh, that might be something I can pick up as well. I saw some promotions for that at Gen Con. So it'd be kind of cool to see yeah. what they do on that. Yeah, good stuff. So, so last big question for you. Uh, what's your, I always like to ask this for game designers too. What's your favorite mechanic? What's the piece for Marvel Multiverse you guys think that you just really nailed? Something you look back to really like proudly or fondly of? I think that bit with the damage dice where we uh, uh, turned the D616 into a two hit and damage roll all in one. That was, that's really the core of the game that makes it sing, right? Um, and it simplified it. Uh, originally, you had to do uh, the first time we did damage dice. You had to roll a hit, then you had to roll the damage, and you had to, the first initial step was like pick up like twelve or eighteen dice and roll them all at once and then add them together. And you're like, well, that's a lot, you know. It's now I played a lot of champions. I love doing that kind of stuff, but that's a lot to ask somebody to do, especially if you're trying to get new players in the game. And then we're like, okay, we're going to stick the three d six, the d six one six. So you roll the dice, but then you get this damage bonus based upon who you are and how much damage you're doing. Blah blah blah. And that was great, except it all felt very samey. And then we're like, okay, now you got to roll the dice again, and they're not connected at all. So we finally trimmed the ranks down to something manageable and made it a multiplier from the Marvel die. It really sang, and I'm, that's probably the best mechanic in the whole game. I really like that one. It's it's one of those ones like I, I feel like people will read it at first, but they just really roll it out, try it. It's really fun. I was I was skeptical until I actually got to play it and get to see it go through. Uh, and, and it's really cool. It streamlines things. Uh, I know there's some multiplication involved. If you're not using a virtual tabletop, and my players did fine with it, even when our tabletop went down for a bit. So uh, it, it's a really cool one. Uh, one thing I'll give a shout out to. I liked how you guys did the edges and troubles and the karma system. Uh, one of my players like was uh, spinning his edges each time, trying to get that fantastic success on the Marvel die. Uh, he was really gunning for it. I think he got it once or twice, uh, but it was really yeah. he kind of liked those interactions. But you get those moments where you, you do that because you you know tweaked every advantage or edge or whatever or karma point to get those dice working for you. And man, when you get it, when it comes through, people literally cheer. Like the whole table will cheer when that happens. It's like yes, fantastic result, Marvel die. People, it's been amazing to watch that happen. I mean, you can always, you can hear people playing the game from the next room, right? If you're at a convention, you're like, oh, they just got a fantastic result right over there. Good for them. <laughs> really cool. So far, I haven't seen somebody get, I don't know what the statistics are, probably very, very low. I haven't seen somebody get a 616, but that's my next big one is seeing somebody there go through There you go. That. It happens. I've seen it happen. It's pretty rare, that, especially without using karma or edges or anything like that. It's hard to pull out. It's doable. It's what, not one in, it's one in 36. Actually, it's not too hard. Oh, right, but that's no. better than I thought. That's not right. Wait a minute. No, we get a 616 raw. It's six times 36. Uh, my brain's going to work. 196. So, oh, um, so that's about, one two, <laughs> yeah, about one in 200 to pull it off, right? Uh, which is doable, but difficult. And But once you start getting the um, the edges and karma in there, uh, again, allowing you to re-roll some of the dice, gives you more chances so you can pull off a little bit more easily. 
I think that's kind of a good, smooth system too. It just makes every uh, everybody knows what to roll, and especially if you're getting newcomers into the game system. Uh, even with kind of we'll pick on like the most favorite D and D with it just having three D six. Everybody knows what a D six is. You don't have to go through and explain each of the different dice. They know exactly what to grab each time, and then have to do a little bit of math. But then they're set. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the neat thing about it is if, if you buy the book and you don't happen to have any D twenties in the house, which a lot of us don't have, you know, a lot of people don't have. Uh, you can just, you know, raid a Yahtzee box and you're all set. You know, you got as many dice as you're ever going to need. Um, and it, it, the edges and karma, I think, is a neat thing because what you do is when you roll the dice, you're like, oh, I missed. You're like, well, wait a minute. What can I do with that? Right. And you get your friends to help you out and use their actions to help you out and stuff like that. And suddenly you have a lot more control over it. So there's a lot less disappointment. Right. A lot of games where you roll, you're like, oh, I missed. And now I just got to wait till next turn. And be like, no, I missed. But let me see if I can pull this off. Right. And, uh, marshal some of my resources to make it happen. And I think that makes it a little bit more exciting for people. It feels much more heroic because of that. Yeah, I think it excuse me, really does fit that heroic vibe, too. Perfect. Well, I wanted to thank you again for coming on with us. Uh, we truly appreciate coming through and kind of tell us a little bit more uh, about the Marvel multiverse. Uh, and definitely uh, community check out in November when the King book is coming out. Uh, I'm going to be getting that for Silver Surfer alone, but definitely let me see the, the cool adventures uh, they've got planned with him and the other crew on that side, too. Uh, and what's 2024? Do you guys have a release date yet for X-Men? Is it just 2024 so far? Uh, it's early 2024. Okay. Right? That's what we've been telling people. And Spider Spider Verse is late 2024. So, uh, you know, uh, we want to have them out at certain dates. They're done when they're done. That's the other part because we want to make sure they're good, right? We don't want to put out something that people say, eh, it could have been better. We want them to get somewhere they say, wow, that was cool. I can't wait for the next one. I'm really happy X Men are going. I mean, probably get the Spider Verse too, but I'm really happy X Men are going first. Uh, and I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what you guys are doing with that one. Uh, so community, go check that out. Uh, and definitely uh, leave some comments about some of the things you guys have liked with the Marvel multiverse as well. Uh, and then uh, go check out our actual play if you haven't already. A little bit of tech difficulties with some of the sound stuff, but still really cool. Get a good dive and good chance to see the system uh, in play. Uh, but thank you again, Matt. And until next time, everybody.